Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Corcoran, Vice President of Education at the New York Botanical Garden. It's a delight to welcome you to the Humanities Institute and the very first event in our series, of, in our new series, The Food Dialogues, Reclaiming Cultural Heritage Through Food, very generously funded by the Mellon Foundation. It's a real privilege to present today's guests, Carla Hall and Tanya Hopkins, and our series moderator, Dr. Jessica B. Harris. Broadly speaking, this series is about food waste, the cultural, historical, and social traditions that surround food. We'll be looking at what we eat, how it gets to us, who prepares it, who's at the table, and more. And we'll see how food can lead us to stories of celebration, survival, and identity. At this moment, this topic couldn't be more timely because foodways are really central to understanding the experience of immigrants, indigenous peoples, and descendants of the African diaspora, and understanding that food has been a way to claim or reclaim a sense of identity and kinship, especially when languages or cultural traditions have been prohibited and erased. So today, our first dialogue will focus on the food of African Americans and how it has shaped American cuisine and culture. Now I'd like to say just a few words about our moderator. Jessica B. Harris is celebrated as America's leading scholar of black culinary history. She is Professor Emerita at Queens College, the globetrotting speaker and a prolific author. Last year, Dr. Harris received the 2020 James Beard Lifetime Achievement Award. And most excitingly, her 12th book on food, High on the Hog, A Culinary Journey from Africa to America, is the inspiration for a new series, which debuts on Netflix next Wednesday. Jessica and the show were profiled in the most recent New Yorker, and show host Stephen Satterfield had this to say about Jessica in the New York Times this week. Dr. J, for me, has always been an intellectual titan, a cultural titan. The only thing I can liken it to is as if you grew up idolizing Michael Jordan or LeBron, and now you are teammates. The Humanities Institute is so honored to have Dr. Harris on our team today, helping guide and moderate the food dialogues. Now, here's Jessica B. Harris. Well, goodness, thank you, Barbara, for that glowing introduction. I, she sounds like a nice person. I'd like to meet her one day. <laughs> Welcome all to the food dialogues. Good morning. How wonderful to be here on this glorious Friday morning in New York City. The only regret I have is that we are not having this conversation in the glorious gardens that are awash with the colors of the season. But before we get into the conversation, let me begin by introducing our two guests this morning, Tanya Hopkins and Carla Hall. Tanya, also known as the Food Griot, is a culinary historian and nonfiction storyteller a cocktail cognoscente, and I'd love to discuss that, and the creator host of the Food Rio shows, which are digital stories, audio narratives, and video shorts, sharing inclusive stories behind the makings of America's cuisines and culinary scenes. Her role extends to the James Hemings Society, a nonprofit she helped to found with Chef Ashbel McLeaven, and with a mission to restore, record, and uphold the timeless Black culinary creativity that's influenced our nation's food ways. Tanya is an active advisor for the Museum of Food and Drink's groundbreaking exhibition, African slash American, Making the Nation's Table. And full disclosure here, I am the lead curator of that exhibit. She's also served as food and drink historian for Carla Hall's best selling cookbook, Carla Hall soul food every day and celebration. And for the launch of Harlem Hops, the nation's first 100% black owned beer hall. Tanya is a wine specialist and educator at Good Wine, a food lover's wine shop in Brooklyn, and a culinary historian and advisor for the Old Stone House and its history and, well, oh, sorry, it's food and public history program. And that's also located in Brooklyn. Now, Carla Hall. Carla Hall needs no introduction for most Americans, but for those of you who are unfamiliar with one of the nation's favorite food people, 
Carla was born in Nashville, Tennessee, and grew up surrounded by soul food. When the time came for her to select her career path, though, she first opted for a business route, graduating from Howard University's business school and working as an accountant, if you can imagine, for two years before deciding to switch gears to work as a runway model in Paris. And then came food. And we'll talk about that transition and how it took place in a moment. Carla Hall first won over audiences when she competed on Bravo's Top Chef and Top Chef All-Stars and shared her philosophy to always cook with love. She believes food connects us all and she strives to communicate this through her work, her cooking, and in her daily interactions with others. Carla spent seven years co-hosting ABC's Emmy award-winning popular lifestyle series, The Chew, and many of you remember her from that. She has been featured on and is still featured on many Food Network shows and is currently hosting Best Baker in America. She was also a judge on Crazy Delicious, which aired on Netflix. Now, Carla hosts a podcast on the Wondery platform called Say Yes with Carla Hall that is focused on interviews with successful people to explore how they overcame challenges and found ways to flourish. Her latest cookbook, Carla Hall's Soul Food Every Day and Celebration, was published in 2018, and it landed on many, many, many annual best cookbook lists across the country and received an NAACP award nomination. So as you can see, we have two individuals who are more than amply able to discuss African-American food ways. So let's begin. Carla, Tanya, welcome this morning. First question. Thank you, Jessica. Thank I you. Know. This is Thank so you. nice to hear her voice reading the bio, Carla. It's like, oh, I know. I know. Let's 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 talk about that for a minute. So I I listen to a lot of audiobooks, and I'm sitting here like, wow, I sound so interesting, right? <laughs> And you are, ever... and you are, and you are, and this is just about your voice. Exactly. Oh I'm, I'm, I'm oh. same thing. I'm listening. I'm like, I don't think I've ever heard my bio read like this. It was just. All right, yo, lady, we're <laughs> gonna take over. You're off and running with this. I'm in charge. I'm moderating. <laughs> you know who you, you know us. <laughs> I was gonna say, oh lord, here comes the herding cats. <laughs> okay, girls, ladies, ladies. But Carla, I'm going to start with you, because I think we all need to know just a little bit more than what that bio said. You're probably one of the most recognizable faces in food today, and certainly the most recognizable African-American one. And yet, as we heard, your career as a chef is a secondary or tertiary one. How the heck did you get into food? What drew you in? I tell you, you know, it's funny. And as you were reading this, and every time my bio is read, I think, wow, when I connect the dots, it really was about food and my grandmother. And if you had asked me 20 years ago, if I would be here now, actually, I guess now it's almost 30 years ago, I would say, I don't believe it because I didn't, I didn't cook. And when I was in Paris, I was used to Sunday suppers and food, bringing people together and talking over food. But then I was in Paris with, we found out, one of your friends, Elaine Evans, who was from Memphis, Tennessee, would host these Sunday brunches for the models. And it was very similar to a Sunday supper at my grandmother's house. And all of the ladies were talking about how certain dishes were made. And I realized, even though I had grown up going to my grandmother's house. I had no idea how anything was made and just the conversation about the food. And I was fascinated and I started going to the English bookstore, buying cookbooks. And so while I was uh, modeling for two years, I would cook as uh, a gift of gratitude for couch surfing. Wasn't glamorous, but I really had a great time. And so that's really how everything started. And when I came back to the States, I started a lunch delivery service as a complete fluke. And I just kept going. And then I did that for five years. And then I went to culinary school at 30. 
And so everything that propelled me, and I'm not saying that it was, it wasn't hard, but I worked every single day for five years before going to culinary school. And I haven't looked back. I think that's so wonderful. So I can now claim that I taught Carla Hall to cook because I taught Elaine to cook. So that's my new claim to fame. We just came up with. That's right. Thank you. Now, Tanya, just what is a culinary historian and how did you get started in that field? Great question. Basically, it's a it's a relatively um, new area of, of history that traditionally, as many people know, was taught through war and, and battle and, and, and so forth. Um, but a culinary historian simply is someone who's looking at the past through food and drink and analyzing the different um, ways that culture and societies are shaped through food and drink and tradition and ritual and holiday and culture and um, even sometimes language and ethnicity and, um, and innovation and creativity. creativity. And as, as um, you both know, as, as a person focused on African-American culinary history, um, there are even extra layers of, of dimension and meaning with the unique role that Black Americans have played in every facet of American food ways. And um, as Barbara mentioned up front early, the erasure that is, that the attempted erasure that's happened over the centuries, which forces us to have to be very um, resourceful in, in researching <laughs> when you focus on African American food ways. I mean, well, I'll just say this one last thing, the name, our name, who else has been named seven things in one century, you know, and, and you get different results when you search Negro or colored, colored with a U, if you're looking at, you know, British sources, Black, Afro-American, let's not forget about that, uh, and African-American. So anyway, it's just, um, there are extra layers as an African-American culinary historian. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm looking at Carla nodding and I'm seeing my head going up and down like the dog in the back of the car, that little statue. And uh, that's kind of the church saying amen there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you call yourself a food griot. First of all, what is a griot? And how does being a food griot connect with African-American food? Another great question. I, I feel like I'm, I'm doing an oral exam and it's like- No, yes. no, no, because we're getting the call on next. <laughs> Everybody gets the hot seat. <laughs> um, but it's just funny telling you, I mean, I'm looking at you too, but I know we're, you know, talking to a lot of people. So a griot is a West African storyteller, historian, raconteur. There are extra other words like poet and musician. And um, it's a very important role that, you know, for, for um, thousands and thousands of years in many different West African societies. And as an African-American with most of our, most African-Americans today have having direct heritage connections to the, you know, the broad region of West Africa, which involves many different today nations and ethnic groups. Um, the griot, you know, is a, is a very important role in terms of keeper of, of knowledge and wisdom and just, you know, kind of just knowing things in the oral tradition. But as a food griot here in America, and to be honest with you, it got on my radar through um, back when I saw Roots, uh, like as a kid. <laughs> That's the first time, yeah, right? The first time that um, my awareness of this, this, you know, this person, the storyteller that, and how important, and then, then learning later about imposed literacy and not only the, the tradition of, of oral storytelling and growing up in a family that of storytellers and gift of gab, shocking, I know. Um, it just became uh, something I was fascinated with. And the more I learned about um, American food ways, my family's connection to it, I felt that, um, oh, that's something I definitely didn't want us to lose it over over time. And so the, the the wisdom transfer from one generation to the next. But I want you and it's a I want I was gonna kind of toss a question back to you, Jessica, about Griot being the French um, pronunciation. Well, griot, yeah, Griot is actually the French variant of a word right. that exists in Malinke, as they say in French, mm -hmm. which would be the word goel. And mm -hmm. the goel is what the French call the griot, and, and the griot is is the keeper of, of the history. 
um, the um, perhaps European equivalent would be some of the minstrels at the medieval courts, because the griots are often, uh, well, the ones that I know of, and you know, this is not encyclopedic by any stretch of the imagination, but the griots are always accompanying their recitations with music. Certainly the Malinke ones and accompany it with the music of the Kora. Kora is a, well, it's a calabash resonator. It's almost like a harp. It has an amazing tone to it. And they they sing that way. And the reference to roots is, is very important because of course, the way that Alfred, Alex Haley, found his origin was from a story that yeah. had been told to a griot and then captured. And Carla, you know about griots too though. So, you know, um, come on, jump in. This is, this is a <laughs> Well, no, I was thinking, you know, it's funny because, uh, well, not funny. I was thinking when, what brought us together, well, uh, me and Tanya was not only her knowledge of culinary history, but people that she knew. And when I was in search of storytelling and trying to reconnect with my history in my family and through the South, she, Tanya had pointed me to different people. And what I had intended on getting were the stories from older people that weren't necessarily in books. And so I wanted to talk to farmers. I wanted to talk to people about their grandparents. And it was, it was just, incredible and even having conversations once I went on this journey having conversations with my great aunt about stories and and actually um, recording them because I think we forget and we don't have we don't rely so much on our memory for telling stories so we, we re just like we rely on pictures I think we just forget and so I'm, I just want to encourage everybody to just get those stories down, record them so that you can remember and so you can pass them down. Right, absolutely. And I mean, I think one of the things that I know I say often is certainly in my experience, people of African descent are people of the word. Um, people of the Jewish faith refer to themselves as people of the book. I think we're people of the word because we deal with orality. It's the <laughs> oral history. It was always passed down orally more than in written sense. And so we have this sense of, of the need to, to speak, but the need to speak it. And I think you make a perfect point, Carla, when you talk about, we all walk around with these little mobile um, cameras and video cameras and tape recorders and everything else in our pockets. And how better mm -hmm. to capture, how better to capture that sense of history or the family history than with that in your conversations. But you also mentioned something else, and I'm gonna ask you another question now. You mentioned talking to farmers and gardeners, and farms and gardens are inextricably connected with food, and we don't often think of it that way. First of all, I wanna go back before I get to that meat of that question and ask, how did you get connected with the botanical gardens? Because this is an amazing place, and you were certainly the linchpin here. And then secondly, how do you see those connections between gardens and food? Well, it was such a blessing, um, especially because I'm from DC. And so a friend, well, let me back up. In DC, I did some work at the Arboretum at the Youth Garden. When I was working at the CHU, I wanted to continue this work. And so um, co-host and friend Mario Batali told me about the uh, the New York Botanical Garden. And I went, when I went to see it and the edible schoolyard, I was blown away. And it didn't take much coaxing to me, for me to understand the connection between kids growing their food and actually having an interest in food and wanting to eat most things that they pick out of the ground. And so the power of that, and I, I've seen kids say, or parents say, I don't eat eggplant, but yet at the garden, they pick an eggplant and you put eggplant on a pizza and they will eat it. And the parents are surprised. So the connection to a child teaching their parents about something that they will eat, because if, if a parent no, doesn't think you're going to eat something, they're not going to purchase it. And so they're going to buy all beige food or whatever. So that connection between the garden and the parents are the children. And, um, 
And I think, and when I walked in and I saw the Italian garden and I, I saw all these different gardens, I was like, oh, wow, you know, maybe there should be um, an African-American garden and, you know, in terms of things that we would eat like okra and black eyed peas and things like that. But I do think learning and understanding what kinds of foods that we grew as a people and the connection and what, what indigenous um, plants came over from West Africa to the United States or, you know, and through the, um, through the spice root and all of that, those are all important conversations to have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I am, I am certainly a partisan of that one. You know, um, we look at all of these foods, we look at where they're from and how they got here and also the, the foods that were here. Let us yes. not forget yes. that, that corn, that peanuts, that so many, the, that the, um, the peppers, the, the chili peppers, is, the yeah. bell peppers, all of those things that were here. So yeah. I mean, that kind of back mm -hmm. and forth ebb and flow is amazing. Now, um, yep, we can, the list goes we on. Go on and on, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> it's old stuff that, that has been in movement for so, so long. Now, Tanya, those connections, you've mentioned some of those foods, but what are the connections that can be made historically between African Americans and gardening? And then by extension, and this is where it obviously gets sticky wicked, African Americans and agriculture. Could you tell yeah. us a little about that. Oh my goodness, how much time do we have, right? Uh, we I mean, got about I... <laughs> another 15 minutes and you may not have all of it, so. No. Of course not. No, but as Carl was as Carl was talking about the um, Italian garden, and you know, I, I was, I was a question came up. You know, was did you feel a sense of a conspicuous absence of, of you know, a the, the African American presence? I know that a lot of times it's just there's a lot of things hiding in plain sight, but you know, when you look at our history and just so many multifaceted connections to. Um, in the, the botanical legacy, the African botanical legacy that is here built on top of the wisdom of indigenous peoples, um, knowledge of, you know, of, of what we built on from them, you know, with African Americans being brought here as the main workforce for, for the agricultural crops, the, you know, that whole story about surviving off of scraps from, scraps from master's table, that's, that's, um, you know, I call it mythology, not that it's not, there aren't, isn't truth in that, but people didn't work as long as they did from sunup till sundown and survive on scraps. There was, they also had, you know, uh, gar their own gardens and plots and hunted and fished and for foraged and, and all these terms that we think of today, farm to, or that we hear today as marketing terms, farm to table and seasonal and sustainable, you know, at, you know, black people, you know, brought here to to work the land, every facet of agriculture, not all food crops, but many food, food crops. I mean, the, the rice crop from, you know, is the, the huge industry. But um, basically, you know, th those are three different angles right well, there. Absolutely. And then gardening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But not only with that, if you want to go ahead, Carly, you've got you lit up. Well, no, I was just saying one of the things in the basis for my book um, soul food every day in celebration. The everyday foods was to sell. Oh, it really was about getting African Americans used to there being vegetables in our <laughs> our diet. Because when you look at celebration foods, the first thing you're going to think of is smothered pork chops. You're going to think of you know oxtails. You're going to think of macaroni and cheese. And so when, when you speak of soul food, people say, oh, it's unhealthy. I'm like, no, actually, if you look at our everyday foods, it isn't unhealthy and it's full of vegetables. And there are plenty of vegan and vegetarian African-Americans because we're not Absolutely. a monolith. But I, I do want to throw out a question that Michelle Blackwell has said, and, and she says, how can African-American chefs preserve culinary history while also having space to reinterpret and innovate. And I think part of it is acknowledging how broad our food is 
because you're not just working in a small space of um, smothered pork chops and macaroni and cheese and collard greens. And so when you look at the, the botanicals, as you talk about, um, Tanya, I think that there is plenty of space to innovate and reinterpret. But that was one of the things that got me so excited about working with you on your book was just returning to that, you know, we were plant based out the gate, you know, it was, it was, mm -hmm. you know, Leah Chase has talked about that, Dick Gregory, so many ancestors before us, yes. you know, um, you, know, Ray, I mean, I... you, Jessica, yeah, it's, 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 we, all that kind of got forgotten or, or it's like the plant based seasonality, you know, growing, eating, you know, I grew up in the garden state, you know, I'm here, I didn't get a chance to tell you guys, I'm in California right now, in my mother's garden, the lemon tree over there, and some roses over there, I always try to get thematic and put on some flowers, but I uh, grew up, I, grew up I got thematic and put on overalls, <laughs> <laughs> I know, we were texting, like, what are you gonna wear, um, and yeah, and are your gardenias there, in the background, but um, the, um, I grew up in the garden state, in South Jersey, which is, you know, people don't think of New Jersey as having a lot of farmland and, but, and, you know, farms up the street, but my grandfather grew, I grew up in a multi-generational family, he grew tomatoes. I remember one summer he did watermelons. It was, you know, it was just, um, and we we're Northern Negroes, you know, and, and like five generations. And there were so many, when I, once I started to learn about Southern food ways and connect the dots. I was like, there's so many similarities. I think there's something bigger here. And oh, sure enough, absolutely. there was. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, and I think this whole notion of farming and, and of the African-American botanical know-how, the gardens, the botanical gardens recently had uh, two s separate um, talks, webinars, one given by Judith Carney on the plants that came from Africa. Yes and equally one on African-American pharmacology, if you will, the, the botany, the, the ethnobotany and the, the medicinal part of the ethnobotany. And we forget, yeah. often forget that, but just to also add a coda to that, because I think it's so important to talk about the centrality of gardens is the whole notion that um, we really are talking about foods that were traditionally plant-based. Meat was a flavoring yes. for a, a holiday. Special occasion. It was right. not an everyday thing. And no. that's pretty much the big disconnect that people don't always see. So there is that, I noticed it. Right. Well, I was talking to Matthew Rayford a couple of days ago and he talked about that and he's a uh, fifth generation uh, farmer from um, Brunswick, Georgia. And when you think about that yard bird, first of all, mm. the, the, the chicken bird. is gonna give you eggs. There so you oh, so chicken out there running <laughs> around, little yard bird. Um, when you think if that chicken is going to give you eggs, it is ongoing, why are you gonna kill it? You're only gonna kill it for a special occasion and it's gonna be an older chicken that's not really gonna give enough eggs. Secondly, you have to think about, and this comes from Lenny Sorensen, think about the oil and the price of oil mm -hmm. and frying. So again, all of the things that have come to be known as soul food, because this is what we were eating when um, people became more migrant, were things that weren't necessarily available at no. the time. And so people were having vegetables or that one chicken. You, I mean, if you think about, you fry a chicken, maybe that's 10 pieces. You split the breast in half, two wings, two thighs, two legs, and the breasts become four. <laughs> that is not going to feed a big family. You need to stretch that chicken with other things. So Hot, the fried the chicken, mm -hmm. right, <laughs> vegetables, you know, stews, Yes. So greens, when we, all kinds mm -hmm. of yes, exactly. And I also want to go back and say, Jessica, when you did the work for the, when you set the program up for the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and I was asked to be the culinary ambassador, looking at your program and reading it really was the start of my journey to get to my book. I mean, and it's just very interesting how everything goes full circle. And when you came to my restaurant, I almost just fell out and over the <laughs> chair, seriously. 
<laughs> because it was a thing that I didn't even know I needed. And so I was, I became so passionate and I realized how much I didn't know. And that was the thing that I wanted to share with other people, not just African-Americans, but anybody who has picked up an Italian book, who has picked up a book about, you know, Indian cuisine. I'm like, we have so much story that has been told, but it, you know, that I want, I'm like, you have thousands of books and other other cultures why can't we have thousands and so we learn more about ourselves exactly exactly this is the sound of the church saying amen again i think that's absolutely 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 that so that when we start to talk about these 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 gardens these these garden plots that traditionally have gone all the way from enslavement um no one documented or very few documented his enslaved peoples more than jefferson Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. And when you read Thomas Jefferson's garden books, and when you read his purchase records, you find he's purchasing food from his enslaved people. They're growing it. He's buying simling squashes. He's buying all, all sorts of things. He's buying food that they have produced. Now, when are they producing it? Uh, the story, the traditional, you know, sort of cant is people work from can to can't. That means from sun up to the time you can't. But after that, after that time, after that work, people would work in their own gardens. And that tells you something about the importance of gardens. And uh -huh. people used to garden. I remember being, my grandmother lived in the projects in New York City. But back in the olden days, slightly before it thundered for the flood, when I grew up, um, houses in the projects came with their own little allotments. They had their own little land yeah. that you could request and get. We're getting back to it a bit now, but we've lost in many cases our connection with the land. Um, but you know, you can grow tomatoes in a big juice can on a fire escape or on a windowsill. I mean, you, it's, this is not impossible to reconnect with. This doesn't require acreage. Have you guys been noticing in, in any of your Zoom meetings, hydro, are they called the hydro um, plants? The hydroponic gardens. Yes. Hydroponic yeah. gardens. I'm, I'm seeing people growing food. It's very exciting. Inside, inside. Yeah, inside, yeah. Hydroponics, but I mean, mm -hmm. so many things. I mean, we talked earlier, we referenced um, schools um, and schoolyards. I, I will, you know, and it, you know, it's been a long time since I was in elementary school, but the blotter, that experiment with the blotter and watching the seed germinate. And then, yes! it. I mean, <laughs> we need to go back to some of that stuff so that we can reconnect, so that we can really think about these things, so that we can see these things and see how they happen and pass them on. Um, we talk about plants from the African continent, and we usually talk broadly about, we talk, okra usually comes up watermelon occasionally, all of that. Rarely do we talk about coffee. Mm. 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 Ethiopian mm. highlands, uh, you know, yes. we, we don't talk about some of the things. We also don't talk about some of the circuitous roots, peanuts that are essentially right. new world that begin somewhere in this hemisphere, then go to the African continent, then return to the Northern mm. part Mm -hmm. from Africa with many people thinking that peanuts are indigenous. So we've got all of these different kinds of ways that foods have migrated and moved and moved forward. So, um, go ahead. And, okay, yeah, and so, oh I mean, you, you mentioned <laughs> coffee and as soon as you mentioned coffee and Tanya, I, I can't remember if we had a conversation about coffee, I think about caffeine, I think about chocolate, I think about cola, I think about Coca-Cola. Um, <laughs> there you so, go, Atlanta girl. <laughs> <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about that? Which of the recipe for Coca-Cola? Well, cola nuts. I, mean, I think, yeah. Cola nuts. Cola nut I mean, back in the 1970s, there was, I guess it was the 70s or 80s, it was Jeffrey Holder, who, for those of you who don't know who I'm referring to, was a very large, very elegant, very black, black man 
who had a resonant voice who sat down, I think he had on a white suit and he would spread his hands and he would say, these are cola nuts and he would show cola nuts. And then these are uncola nuts and he would show lemons and limes. And it was some kind of commercial for a lemon lime beverage. I don't even remember. Yes, the uncola. The uncola. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But the idea of the cola nuts, uh, one of the first things I learned going to the continent was there are cola nuts, they are chewed, they are usually in the pockets, if you're in Senegal, in the pockets of somebody's boo-boo somewhere, and you are not supposed to just have, uh, you don't take cola, you don't accept cola. First of all, women don't do cola. It's a, um, it is a stimulant. Uh-huh. It's a stimulant and it breaks, uh, it has religious connotations in parts of Nigeria, you can throw obi, obi cola, obi um, will allow you to to read an oracle. So all of these things that that we don't even think about, and yet that are a part of us when we see something as as truly American as coca, cola, and cola was part of the original recipe, I've been told. The coca part, yes. The coca-cola part. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but the, the cola nuts, um, yeah, they were used in so many different ways. And one way was to freshen the water that um, in the transit, in the, in, the, in the transatlantic transit. That's the beginning of, I think, for, uh, in terms of it coming to America and becoming um, used in the culinary sense, particularly for beverages, for drinks and so forth. But yeah, it's just, it's from, it comes here with the people, you know, um, to your point, Jessica, all the pre-Columbian, uh, the, all the exchange that was happening, the Columbian exchange and the transatlantic uh, exchange, but the cola nut, there's some, there's certain things that are direct, unique, you know, from, from the culture, from the land, from the culture that come here and profoundly impact America uh, forever. You know, watermelons, right? That summertime uh-huh. fruit that, you know, people have their watermelon eating contests and, you know, African-Americans are shamed with the imagery all throughout the 19th century. You know, a gift from God, it is hydration and nutrition at the same time. Well, and and it's, also it's water that, it's, it's liquid that can be consumed when water may be of exactly. doubtful health value. So you've got all of that. Going. Yes. Right, and that was one of the things that shows up in many different, I mean, of course, slavery, you can't talk about it you know, monolithically, homogeneously, but and it, it's different across the timeline and, and geographically, but that is one of the things that um, uh, had a high incidence of being grown in the slave gardens or the gardens that, uh, for that reason, for hydration. And, 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 you know, that was a very efficient way to, if you are working up from can to can, sun up till sundown and, you know, water, water uh, situation, that's a brilliant solution. And it's from Africa, as are many cucumbers, because they're related to the cucumbers and, uh, you know, the, the, the pickling that happens in the South. A lot of times, I, I mm-hmm. grew up assuming, oh, that must have been a European thing. Nope. You know, um, you grow that, you, you find out that um, they are also coming from there. And you, and you look at it and you're like, oh, of course, cucumbers and melons are related. And- <laughs> it makes so much sense when you say that. When you look at the outside, and I'm going to, as you talk about this, and you talk about um, uh, this food waste, I want I want to bring in, uh, Carmen had a question. She says, what do you think the Caribbean has, what role do you think the Caribbean has played mm. and continues wow. to play, if it, if at all, in African American oh, no, no, no. food waste? Absolutely. Caribbean yeah. is- From day one, is yeah. Is the linchpin. It, it's, it's where things transit because First yes. of all, the climate, think just think straight up climate. You can grow things in the Caribbean that you can't grow in the continental United States. Um, planted. <laughs> well, planted yeah. yams, true yam. Yams, you know. true yams. Um, mm-hmm. You've got uh-huh. all of those things. So the, and, and also, um, let's be clear when we start to talk about this transatlantic slave trade, that mm-hmm. it was A, not monolithic, B, Mm-hmm. very much divided by culture. See, Absolutely. people were fed and force-fed different things on different voyages. And perhaps the most important thing to remember is that 
the slave traders knew more about African, West African cultures than we do now. So that they were very mm -hmm. clear on what peoples would and wouldn't eat because their economic survival depended on being able to get their cargo of humans across that Atlantic transit, that ugly thing, safely, not necessarily healthily, but they had to have folks who survived that journey. And so they had to feed them things they would eat. They had to have enough food. They had to have all sorts of things like that. We don't even think about that today. Right. And you know, Jessica, even as you're mentioning that, um, so the Caribbean plays a large role, but you think oh, only 5% of the enslaved people came to the United States. Exactly. That's I where mean, I was going with that is if you start to look at the parts of the <clears throat> hemisphere that are south of the United States, that's mm -hmm. where you're seeing the major influence. Uh, when you see things in the Caribbean, we've got uh, sort of in the, in the Virgin Islands, you've got fried fish and fungi. Well, guess what? Keeps its African name. Uh, you've got fufu even in, um, mm -hmm. in Cuba. You've got duknu in Jamaica. You've got all of these dishes that not only retain their, their form, but also in many cases, their names or derivatives of their names. Uh, okra in, um, in Spanish, quimbombo, you know, uh -huh. which is very much like quimbombo, which is uh -huh. one of the Bantu languages. I think it's Kikongo, uh, but you've got all of those things all of those connectors. In, in Brazil, you get an acarajé, which is a, an illusion of acaraíje, acara being a bean fritter. Acarajé is the popular street food in Bahia and then goes through. So when you start to look at the hemisphere as a hemisphere, you've got stuff going on that is just extraordinary, that is you know pretty amazing. And then you see America is a very, very small part of that. We just they, they, a lot of us now, we loud and we vote. We're just loud. <laughs> there you go. But, yeah. but the and, Caribbean and, is definitely there is in answer to uh, the per individual's question. Definitely and, there and and the, definitely important. The main driver, you know, sugar, the sugar cane crop. I mean, the yes. sugar cane being- Sugar the, through, through the, Brazil, through Pernambuco, Brazil, into Barbados, and then all the way up that whole sugar revolution in the Caribbean. Uh, America, the southern part, that would be Louisiana. Yeah. Sugar is dying out by the time it gets to Louisiana. It gets to Louisiana in the late 18th, early 19th century. It's in Barbados in the 17th century and in Brazil in the 16th. Crazy. And one of the reasons Brazil's, you know, the, um, Brazil and the U.S., you know, are among the last to let go of, of, uh, to abolish slavery, that sugar, no, that should Brazil and Cuba, not the US. And Cuba. Cuba. Brazil and Cuba, well, the last two. The US of, is yeah. late. The US is well, late. It's Brazil and it's Cuba. Late. Right. But, and arguably linked to um, how sugar being a main driver of what kept those ships coming here. And why so many, to your point, Carla, you know, go to uh, the Caribbean, Central America, South America, um, is that it's because of that, that king sugar or queen sugar the sugar crop mm -hmm. yeah Which while means, we're talking oh, and we're at a pause um i know it's 11 45 i want to start um reading off some questions if you ladies don't mind okay but before um, we do that for just a second yes i want to ask each of you um what are you working on before we before we go to questions i know that you each have a ton of projects and i want you to just share one or two so that people can continue to follow you and keep this discussion perhaps going so well Tanya. the one that i'm really excited about <clears throat> that um that is is being talked about on discovery plus is my new show and it's called food ways with carla hall we haven't started filming yet because we're waiting until after the the pandemic and we can travel safely but it it is honestly about taking a dish that's in America and tracing it back almost like who do you think you are so that it is a trail of a credit I mean to credit the different cultures that intersected um, and so and to give them credit and to, to, to things that you think aren't um, uh, you would think that are American there are there's so many groups because of 
immigration that came into a particular dish. So that's one thing. Um, you'll hear now about you that. You have a later. new book out. I do. Share the book. Share the book. <laughs> Carla and the Christmas cornbread. I am so excited about this. This comes out this year. This is just a galley. And look, there, there I am. Ah. Um, it oh, is a woman who is from um, <clears throat> Um, Cerise Harris is from Barbados oh and she is the illustrator. I'm super excited about it. And um, so it's taken from my life with my grandmother and those Sunday suppers. So those are the big things that I have going on. Okay, Tanya, what you got for us? Currently in production, serving up some savory, sometimes sweet stories, uh, primarily in podcast format, relaunching the Food Rio Chronicles podcast next month, and um, also producing some short video stories as well. Um, doing a bunch of different talks and events, and uh, uh, going to collaborate with um, uh two of my favorite culinary cronies again. Oh, that would be you too. Uh, on, uh, we're talking to oh my God, I know. You, with you, Jessica, on Juneteenth. And then Carla, we got something simmering up for later this year with the uh, Aspen uh, event. Um, but yeah, just, um, you know, researching, writing, and, and serving the stories up in as creative ways as possible, having a really fun time well yeah. that's great uh, that's yeah. great okay now carla you can go to those questions i'm sorry but I'm, gonna <laughs> okay. to I'm gonna go to those questions but i want to piggyback somebody was saying earlier to another to an earlier question about how chefs can connect back to this history one of the things that i know that they're doing at aspen food and wine when i have um, a set of recipes i called tanya and i said i would like to have some historical some historical connection to recipes that i do so that i'm not only giving you a cooking demo demonstration i'm also telling you why i chose these ingredients so that there's an educational um component to my dishes so you're not just walking away with why i cook this thing but why i chose these ingredients and this dish and walking away with the history of that um, all right, so Leanne Thornton says the discussion about plant-based diets being lost is really important. How do you reconcile the convenience of accessing celebration or sometimes or sometimes food with getting people to understand how unhealthy it is to eat those foods all the time? Well, that would be for you or for Tanya. You're reading the question. Okay. So I'm gonna say that that was one of the reasons that I wanted to do my book. And I, and I think yes. that part of the pride that I feel when I understand what gifts we had as African-Americans um, to, to grow these foods and to tap into that and to share why people should be proud. Um, we were chosen for a reason. And that is what I choose to lean into. And, I, and that's what I choose to share with people. I mean, yes, it, it has been hard, you know, and, and you, if you keep thinking about being enslaved, but we were just like gold was chosen, just like, you know, cotton was chosen. People were chosen to grow certain things because they had the ability to grow that. And I want, and I lean into that. And so in terms of plant-based diet, I mean, I, my soul food cookbook is mostly vegetables. So that's how I choose to continue that and to share that with people. Yeah, redefining it, reclaiming it. Um, it's not even it's not even about reinventing or coming up with something new. It's literally about just re-remembering that. Acknowledging. Um, acknowledging it. Yes. And, and 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 deciding that, you know, no, we're not being something else or nouveau by, you know, eating kale or, or whatever. It's like, no, that's that's you know, all the greens, not just kale you know, dandelion and, and turnip and, and beet, and anything. All the green. And beet and all yeah. Of them. Yeah. And you mentioned kale. So just one little fun I fact, know. maybe, which was uh, traditionally African-Americans on New Year's Day have greens of some sort for folding mm -hmm. money. Dr. Maya Angelou always had kale as her. Oh, really? Collards. Yes. Wow. Next question. I love that. All right. Here's the next question. <clears throat> Um, this is from Antoinette Jones. Are there any resources that teach African-American history recipes and indicate 
caloric nutritional content to help assist calorie counters. Oh. Ooh. All right. Well, well, Jessica, I mean, you can take the first part of that uh, resources that teach African American history. I mean, well, I mean, there are a growing number of resources that teach African American history through food. Um, but the calorie counting part is going to be the tricky part there. A lot of the cookbooks don't necessarily have the calorie counts in it, but there are any number of online um, apps that will enable yes. you to input the recipe and you'll get your calorie count and you can adjust it accordingly. But there are there are multiple, multiple cookbooks. I mean, um, uh, from all the way back in the, well, back in the back in the day, the first African-American cookbook is Melinda Russell and it's the mid 19th century, just post emancipation, all the way up to, you know, things that are coming out today. Um, Bryant Terry, who does um, vegan food, he is sort of like our black vegan guru, um, mm -hmm. uh, has a new book coming out called Black Food, and he's got um, vegan recipes and an international selection of them. So that there's a wide range, that, that entire scope, that entire yeah. you know, scope of food and, and books to, to go to. Uh, in and my I think, book, Jessica, I that was a geography. Now, that was a great suggestion about um, getting apps because the the, yeah. the cookbooks aren't going to have them, and because it's, there's too much there's too much wiggle room in terms of what what ingredients you choose. But an app would actually do that, and I and I use um, an app and put recipes in to see what my calorie count is. Mm -hmm. Um, do you want me to go on? Tanya, you okay with me going to the... Okay, so here's one. Will you please share thoughts on ways the home cook can honor and hold onto our culinary cultural history? Just a few tips for accessible things that won't require a culinary degree. Um, <laughs> I think that I, 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 I really think it's sharing the stories. And, and I want to say one of the things that I was doing with my mom is actually cooking with her during the pandemic over Zoom because we rarely cook together and because we don't live in the same state, it was, it, we just didn't do it. And she doesn't cook, but she would always call me and ask questions. And I said, mom, let's, let's do it over Zoom. And it became kind of a thing and something that we started to share. And you just don't, it's the sharing that we have to get back to. When you think about people being in the same house and they're seeing each other, that little act of actually doing something online and passing down a recipe and just seeing um, like the pinch and the drizzles and you know all of that is holding on to our, his our history. Okay but I would also add to that if you do something like in a zoom record it. Mm, yeah. yeah oh my gosh yes. Record yes. it. Yes. Record it so that then you begin to have the archive of the family recipes recorded over zoom that kind of stuff wasn't available 20 years ago, 30 yeah. years ago. So the fact that we have this technology now allows all of us to be able to literally archive cooking with our grandparents, our, our aunts, uncles, elders, however you focus that. And that's going to be important, maybe not in the immediate, hopefully as far off as possible, but when the elders become the ancestors, having that knowledge would be important. And extending that beyond to, to extended family and to you know, oh, our communities and churches everybody. and play cousins and you know, aunties, right? All the aunties that you're not really mm -hmm. actually blood related, you know, just kind of really um, to speaking to the answering the part about, you know, celebrating the culture, you know, within our families, but also beyond into the communities. And because we just, can take things for granted sometimes but but when you start to pay attention and you know like well, you said as, as you get older point. you realize that they're not always going to be here when you're no. young you figure that right. they're going to be here but they're not yeah. always going to be here and so you want to get them while they're here and while they are in the fullness of their here yes yes um courtney um nidig nidig i'm sorry if i've butchered your name but courtney Ann. 
Um, hi all, so fangirling right now, listening to you all. I would like to ask, I'm an educator and concern myself and my research with children and school gardens as a form of rec uh, recollection and remembering our relations to land. As a white person living in a Canadian pro um, province, I mean, province, province, which does not have many people of province, right? Uh, which does not have many people of color, primarily beautiful black bodies, thank you. Um, how can I amplify and highlight black fooding um, his, histrosities without tokenizing or um, exonifying? exonifying? Mm -hmm. But I, you know what? I think, um, I know, uh, thank you, Courtney. Um, I, I think it is all about intention. I, I think that um, th this, it's, it's interesting because, and, and you all tell me what you think. When you do make Italian food, when you make Indian food, when you make all of these other cuisines, do you feel the same way? And if you don't, why? Because why should you feel the same way with this food? I. Okay, I would say several things. I would say, um... Well, my whole thing, whenever I'm asked this question, because I think that um, this whole notion of appropriation can become a very slippery slope very rapidly. So I usually say, Aretha, think Aretha. And by that, I mean R-E-S-P-E-C-T. -E That's what you need. Just mm -hmm. think Aretha, respect. If mm -hmm. you respect the food, if you respect the people who create the food, if you were using a recipe in some ways, I think, be very sure to attribute it, to yes. pay for it. If you are in some kind of a commercial venue and you have a recipe that you are monetizing, make sure that the people from whom you've obtained the recipe are appropriately and adequately and more than adequately in many cases paid. I think that that's the problem. It's yeah. not the borrowing. I mean, there wouldn't be French food if there yeah. hadn't been Italian food. You know, uh, Chinese food has inflected all of South Asia. Right. Um, you know, uh -huh. we need we be a Japan, little yeah. less territorial and simply a lot more gracious. Uh -huh. And vice versa, yeah. Um, I mean, I just, I would just add, add okay. to that. Just, you know, I think that, um, you know, to your point, Jessica, about respect, I think, and it's also, it's also gratitude too, in terms of we have, you know, there's so many things we can just open the fridge or press a button and order things, you know, so many people um, that came before us, just, just to be grateful for these great things and to know that everybody has brought so much to the table. And a lot of times the story of the ancestors of African heritage are not part of that narrative or not part, part of that story that that's not taught in public education you have to seek out it out through programs like this and and um uh public television and things like that so i think it's about just just even that intent just just asking that question but just uh -huh. remembering that everyone everyone has brought a lot to the table and just if we knew more the more we know hopefully the more we can be appreciative of of everyone Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I feel like this conversation can go on and on and on. I know. I know <laughs> we are. And there's such great questions. And I'm sorry I didn't get to you all's questions. Uh, Musao Dabinga, great question Musao. about how can we reclaim our generational wealth that was lost to folks who usurped <sighs> our recipes and made millions. Um, I mean, they're just, there's just, um, please recommend resources for passionate gardeners, gardener, gardeners like myself who want to grow herbs and veg from the African diaspora. There's just so many questions and hopefully um, those can be captured and answered later through um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the botanical gardens. And so I think we're going to bring back Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Oh, I have you to thank. What a lively, informative conversation. The time's flown by. I want to thank all of you for setting the table so beautifully for this new series. 
I just want to say that on the subject of African Americans being people of the word, which you uh, talked about earlier in oral histories, um, an anchor of our new foodways initiative, this very one funded by the Mellon Foundation, is an oral history project where we are collecting and sharing the food narratives of our community gardeners and farmers in the Bronx. So there's a really large, diverse network of community gardens and urban farms in the Bronx with fascinating stories to share. We can't wait to, to dive into that and make that a part of this larger initiative. Great. So before I sign off and we all sign off, a few quick things. Know that the next Food Dialogue is on June 18th. Jessica will be in conversation with food historian Michael Twitty and chef JJ Jackson. The subject will focus largely around rice and on the food and the foodways of Juneteenth. So please join us. It's going to be great. Tanya, looking forward to the relaunch of your blog and video stories. Carla, I look forward, we all do, to Foodways with Carla Carl Hall. I just also want to right now give a special shout out of your book because <laughs> I personally recommend the zucchini cheddar bread. I made it for my family <laughs> twice already. They love it. Uh, and it's got zucchini in it, plenty. And yes. Jessica, we're it's really good. looking forward Good luck with that Netflix series, High on the Hog. I, uh, I, I, there's anything any of the three of you want to add to what I just said, um, but it's just been, a, you're so gracious. It's been really wonderful. Thank you for your time. And I do want to leave you with a little visual taste of High on the Hog. So anybody who doesn't have time can leave, but if not, stay with us. We're going to queue up a little promo video for that beautiful uh, series that we're all looking forward to. Anything else you want to say before we sign off? Thank I just want to say so thank much. you, Jessica. Thank you, Tea Pop. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank, thank you. you Jessica. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, See you Barbara. next month. NYBG. See you next month, Vanessa. Thank you. And Charles back there typing away. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Call our food soul food. Cheers. This type of food, you can feel when you eat it. Ah, that aroma. The truth is, a lot of American food has its roots in African American food, traditions, and ingenuity. Can you see it already smells like mac Absolutely. and cheese? This standard yummy dish has a really old history. I'm Steven Satterfield, and I'm on a journey to uncover the stories of African American food and meet the new generation preserving our history. We charred and dressed this beautiful cabbage with pear preserves. Okra is African because it made the voyage with us. It did. We brought it to the new world. Despite the fact that we were in hell, we were suffering, somehow in all of that nonsense, we created a cuisine. Is this something that would have been served to Jefferson and Washington by their enslaved chefs? Absolutely. Hercules and Hemings were foundational to the foods that we love today. When you understand your history mm -hmm. and understand where you come from, that mm -hmm. understanding gives you purpose. <laughs> trying to keep the culture going as a blessing. Your turnip greens have transported me back in time. We have a deep tradition yes. that you're honoring in a place yes. like this. But our legacy isn't found in statues or history books. It lives on in the people who guard the gates of our culture. Wow. This is a showstopper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> our story is America. All right, I just have to say that is amazing. I cannot wait to see it. Like, wow. Anyway, thanks, y'all. Oh, like party coming on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You. You. Yes. Uh, you've seen it. You saw a lot of friends in there. So, yep, all the rabbits, friends, and relations turn up. So.
It's oh, I pretty love amazing. it. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank all right. You. Thank you all, ladies. Yeah. Have a great Goodbye, weekend. Goodbye, all. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Take good care. Be well. I'll be in touch with everybody. Take it easy. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Botanical <laughs> Gardens. Yes.